morning, Hei Lagechevra. Thank you so much for being here. This really means a lot to all of us that you're here with us tonight, just a few days before Shavuos, to, to learn and to hear um, and to experience um, the, uh, the Kabbalah Satara, the accepting of the Torah in a, in a more uh, deep, meaningful, and spiritual way. Tonight, um, we're going to keep the same format. First of all, I just wanted to thank all of you for coming. I just want to thank Rabbi Landis for putting, for putting this all together, for making this possible, for really going above and beyond to make this a truly amazing event. Um, I wanted to thank Rabbi, Rabbi Spiro, Rabbi Tenenbaum, Rabbi T, um, Rabbi Kovell, Rabbi Friedner, and Chana Parel Handler, for, 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 and Rabbi Landis, of course, for coming and for sharing with us their incredible wisdom and timeless messages uh, to help inspire all of us to uh, have, have a more meaningful Shavuos. The format of tonight will be as we've done in the past. It's 613, a very timely um, format where we will have six short bursts of inspiration, um, about 13 minutes long, and um, it will give us some time to digest the message, but not, not too long that we get lost in the, uh, in the shear. Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Rabbi T, a very special, a warm yid, a dear friend, and the associate associate regional director in in the Cleveland area in the east in the associate, central east, if I think it's is what it's is what it's called, um, and 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 really really a special person. You guys are really in for a real treat. He's an incredible speaker, a, a wonderful educator, and 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 and, and, uh, and really really has some deep messages to impart. So without any further ado, Rabbi T. Thank you so much, AJ. Thank you for that warm pre-recorded introduction, which I haven't seen really, it was too much. Every time we, sorry. Every time we come to Shavuos, I like to think of the imagery where the Jewish people are surrounding the mountain and Moshe ascends to the heavens, so to speak. And there's this big fight between him and the angels because God wants to give him the Torah but the angels aren't right, willing to give it up. And they go back and forth. Could Moshe have it? Should the angels keep it up in there in heaven? And I always think, what exactly is that conversation? I mean, imagine a few months from now, please God, we're all going to be back in our shuls. It's going to be Simchas Torah. We're dancing around the shul. And your three-year-old son comes over and says, Daddy, could I hold the Torah? No one in their right mind would give the little child a Torah. It's the equivalent of a guy traveling through Paris. And he, in his mind, he decides he's going to visit all the famous museums, so he walks into one particular museum. And he's walking through the museum, and he gets this crazy thought in his mind. He's going home with the Mona Lisa. That's what he thinks. He's going home with the Mona Lisa, a painting we all know, Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece, created in the early 1500s. And he's going home with it, perhaps one of the most expensive pieces of art in the world. So he's walking through the museum and he walks over to one of the curators and he says, excuse me, sir, but I'm taking that. The guy says, you're taking that? He says, yeah, yeah, you see that painting over there, that Mona Lisa? I'm taking that. So the, the head of the museum is going to come over and say, this guy's crazy. They'll call security. They'll, they'll kick him out of there. That was the equivalent, but not even close. Moses goes into the heavens, he's going to take the Torah down from the heavens. The angels say, not a chance. This is our Torah. There's no way you're doing that. What, what was that conversation? What were they fighting about? Moshe versus the angels. What exactly was that conversation? So I want to go back to an earlier story in the Torah. And I would argue that you can find pretty much anything that you need to answer in the first few chapters of the Torah. The climax of the creation story is the moment on the sixth day of creation where God blows into the nostrils of Adam in Ishama. This piece of the divine. That moment was the moment where Adam was transformed from a mere flesh and blood into a piece of the divine. This sort of dichotomy of man, which is both animal and angel, both divine and physical. And that was the moment that we were, a bit, we were able to choose what we were going to do in this world. 
Animals don't have that choice. They work on instinct. Whereas man has the ability to use their, the, his intellect in order to make bigger decisions. Ramchal tells us right at the beginning of his famous work, Derech Hashem, the path to God, or the way of God, Ramchal tells us that God is the ultimate giver. He created this world because He's that ultimate giver. And the ultimate giver doesn't give. The ultimate giver allows the person to develop, to grow. Because if God would have just given us everything, it wouldn't have felt as accomplishing. If you come into your child's crib in the middle of the night and they need a bottle, maybe they need a drink of water or some milk, that child doesn't feel accomplished, it just got what they needed. They cry and they get the bottle. But God created this world not that we could just receive the bottle, but that we could create that bottle, so to speak. That we could use our choices, our free will, in order to rise above our animalistic instincts. To use the neshama which God blew into us in order to become greater givers. Because the ultimate giver is going to allow the person to feel that they are not actually receiving, but rather that they are the, a giver than themselves. July 12th, 2012, my phone rang at 5.30 in the morning. At the time, my daughter had woken up. I was just going back to my bed after giving her a pacifier or something. And my phone rang, which usually I wouldn't hear at 5.30 in the morning. And I went and I saw it was my mom calling. She was on the East Coast. I was out in Colorado, so the time difference, she was already awake. For her, it was 7.30 a.m. I answered the phone. I said, hey, what's going on? Good morning. I don't, I don't know if I really had any words. I was still sleeping. She said, oh, oh are you okay? I said, am I okay? I just, I mean, the baby just woke up. I'm going back to bed. What are you talking about? And she breaks down crying. I had no idea what she was talking about. I didn't know why she was calling me in the middle of the night to ask me if I was okay. She then went on to tell me that there had been a shooting in a movie theater a few miles from my house. And the only reason that she would even fathom that I would be in that movie theater is that that summer I was running a, boys, a middle school boys camp, a camp for boys in middle school. And they convinced me we're going to see the opening of the Batman movie, Dark Knight Rises. I think that's what it's called. And they convinced me, so we had a pizza party late at night at like 11 o'clock at night. We were having pizza at my house, and then we went to the movie theater, and we saw the movie, the Batman movie. And when it was over, I went home and I went to bed. Only when my mom called me at 5.30 in the morning did I learn about the shooting in a theater a few miles in the other direction from my house. A theater my mom thought I could have been at. Thank God I wasn't there and we were all okay. But a friend of mine, he was in that theater. And when he goes and he describes his story, or really the outcome of his story, he says that at the moment where he came out alive, he recognized that the Almighty was saying, I need you. I want you. And you're going to do something big because you're not just a, a, an animal living here on this earth, but you're somebody with free will. You have an neshama. You have an opportunity to do great things. And he's working on doing those great things. I have another friend. It was Yom Kippur. He was in shul. He was probably in about high school. Now, he grew up very traditional. He didn't grow up in synagogue. He didn't grow up with kosher or anything like that. And he actually grew up with a certain syndrome, which got him bullied at school. And he was having a really, really rough life. He was bullied because he was Jewish, although he wasn't really Jewish. And he was being bullied because of his syndrome. And life was very tough. So anyways, he's in Yom Kippur. He's in synagogue on Yom Kippur with his grandfather. And he's thinking to himself, if there's a God, it would only make sense that there's a God because I have so much suffering, there must be a message for me. And that's when he went on a couple of years of discovery to recognize that, yeah, Judaism is actually legit. That Judaism is real and that God created the world and is sustaining the world. And he actually went on to become a rabbi and he's doing wonderful. But there are moments in our lives where we need to make big decisions. We're not the first people to do this. We had a grandfather who made those decisions. Avraham, Abraham, the, the father of monotheism, the man who discovered that there was an almighty and there's only one creator of this universe and only one sustainer of this universe, and that's God himself. And Avraham Avinu, our father, he started that off for us. He started this journey that we're really just following in his footsteps. Chidush Arim, one of the great Hasidic masters, tells us that in Shemona Esrei, in the silent devotion, when we say Hashem, that we mentioned that God is the Mugain Avram, the shield of Avraham, 
were referring to those sparks that he let off from himself when he made that original decision. When he chose to follow the path of God and develop monotheism in what we know it as today. We're following in that he's shielding us. We are the grandchildren of Avraham. Talmud tells us there were 26 generations that lived with pure mercy of God. Those were the generations prior to the giving of the Torah at Sinai. God didn't give us the Torah yet, and those generations just lived because God mercifully allowed them to live. But from the moment of Matan Torah, when we were given that Torah, no longer would it just be based on the Almighty's mercy, although there's a lot of that. But it was also based on our actions. Moses, he ascends the mountain, he comes into the heavens, he says, I'm going to take the Torah, and the angels say, no way. We can't trust you. You're just a person. You're going to be the one that holds the Torah, you and your nation. You're going to hold the Torah down there. That means our existence is based and relying on you. The angel said, no way, we can't handle that. So God did something for the angels. God showed the angels that this is Moses. But he also looks a little bit like Abraham. Remember Avram? Remember 400 years ago when you angels went down to the tent of Avram and you saw a mere mortal, so to speak, a man who was in, imbued with the, with the divine, he has a neshama, and he was making choices based on that neshama. Don't worry about it. This is not just Moshe. This is a grandson of Avram Avinu. We are all grandchildren of Avram Avinu. We have this beautiful Torah, and we're able to uphold that Torah. Where do we see that story? One of the most famous converts of all time. We're going to read about her. Rus. She was a person who was living in certainly not a Torah way, and when she tapped into Torah for her first time, she said, this is it. I choose Torah. And she followed in the footsteps of Avraham, and she converted, and she became a part of our nation. And in fact, one of the most important grandmothers in our nation. We know that King David, David HaMelech, comes from Rus. Rabbi Yonis and Ibeshitz, one of the great rabbis of the 1700s, he writes in his book, Yaros Devash, that in the silent devotion, Shemona Esrei, when we ask the Almighty Al Hatzedikim Vala Hasidim to please protect and take care of the righteous and the pious, we throw in there and the gay rate tzedek, we throw in that also the righteous converts. Rabbi Ayyubishit says that that's not just thrown in there, but that's perhaps the main point of that blessing. We want to focus that there are people today, in our day and age, that look for truth, they seek truth. And they find that truth in Judaism. And they convert, they change their lives, they do things differently because they found that truth. That's who we're praying for. We should love the convert because they're doing something so great. They are modern day Avram Avinos. I'm going to add, this is on my own, but I think it's true. It's not just those who convert, it's anybody who has a past that they choose to change based on their free will choices, based on recognize, recognizing the Almighty in this world. It's any person who says, I want to fix up this aspect of my life. I want to change that aspect of my life. We're living the divine. When the Almighty blew into our nostrils in a shama, we're taking that serious. Shavuos is a time that we call Matan Torah Seinu, when the Almighty gives us the Torah, but it's also called Kabbalah Satorah, receiving the Torah. It is our mission, it's our responsibility, this Shavuos and every Shavuos, to receive the Torah. When somebody hands you something, grab hold of it, hold it close to you, and live that very great life like your grandfather, Avram Avinu. Wow, Rabbi T, that was, that was incredible and truly amazing. I, I can say that um, I will be definitely davening Shema in, uh with with much much more inspiration than 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 I than I was until now. Um, that was that was deeply meaningful, and thank you so much for sharing those incredible words with us. So now we're going to take it to Rabbi Kovel, Rabbi Yosef Kovel, who is a lecturer with, at JFX and uh, a very talented lecturer at JFX, a facilitator of Partners in Torah with JFX as well, and uh, also also an attorney by day. And uh, most recently, just married off his son in a barn. Um, you know, I guess that's that's that's, that's his latest claim to fame. So, uh, if you have any questions about where to where to where to do a wedding in a barn over the next year um, with social distancing, please feel free to reach out to Rabbi Kovel. Without any further ado, Rabbi Kovel, thank you so much for coming tonight.
wanted to share a few thoughts about the upcoming holiday, holiday of Shavuot. Shavuos, known in, in our uh, vernacular, in the Ashkenazic uh, lexicon. The holiday of Shavuos commemorates most notably the giving of the Torah over 3,400 years ago at Mount Sinai at Har Sinai. The Torah, which is the centerpiece and what makes the Jewish nation a nation that we are, this is what gives us our lifeblood, essential to not only the Jewish nation, but essential to mankind and the creation of the world, as it's told to us that God created the world in order to be able to give the Torah to this world. Without the Torah being given to the world, and without a people there to accept the Torah and to accept a commitment to keep the Torah, the world would cease to exist. There's a fascinating passage in the Talmud that brings down an interesting disagreement between two of the leading sages. And this is in regards to holidays, Yom Tovim, in general. And the concept is as follows, and this is based on verses, I'm not going to get into the details of it, just give a brief overview of it. How does one approach the observance of a Jewish holiday, of a Jewish festival? We know there are three main festivals in Judaism, Pesach, Passover, Shavuot, this coming holiday, and Sukkot. The three regalim, the three festivals. How is the approach one is supposed to take in regards to these holidays? The Talmud tells us two opinions. One opinion, one rabbi says, is that a person is supposed to involve himself in the holiday with one of two options. Either they can involve themselves as dedicating the holiday towards God, towards spiritual pursuits, towards things that are more spiritual in nature, prayer, Torah study, meditation, things that are of a spiritual nature. And that would be the focus of the holiday. And less so, obviously a person is not supposed to fast, but no real indulging and no real involvement in the physical needs of a person. That's one opinion. The other opinion, or, or I'm sorry, or this opinion says, that if a person chooses, then they can really involve themselves more in physical and less in spiritual. Meaning, as the Talmud says, either he has the choice, make the holiday more about yourself, about your physical needs, or more about God. The other opinion, the other sage says that no, the holiday has to be split, divided. Half the holiday in spiritual needs, half the holiday in physical needs. So come up with a split, not necessarily 50-50, but split the day between physical and spiritual pursuits. Says the Talmud that everyone agrees, when with regard to the holiday of Shavuot, everyone agrees that one is not allowed to only engage in spiritual pursuits. The holiday of Shavuot, everyone agrees, needs physical indulgence. A person has to be involved in physical, in physical allowances. A person has to enjoy a good meal. A person has to take time out of the day to have some form of physical pursuit. And that's specific with this holiday of Shavuot. So this opinion, who says, when it comes to Pesach, when it comes to Sukkot, a person can involve themselves, if they want, dedicate the holiday to, fit to spiritual needs, if they choose to do so, comes the holiday of Shavuot, a person has to involve himself in some physical pursuits. Paraphrasing this, this disagreement in the Talmud. The question that begs to be asked is obvious. This seems to be counterintuitive. The th of the three holidays, the holiday that seems to be the most spiritual in nature would be the holiday of Shavuot. The holiday of Shavuot commemorates the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. The Torah is a spiritual entity. The Torah is the divine document of God, the blueprint for the world and the instruction manual for life. It's completely spiritual. Out of all the three holidays, which a person should be involved in, involving themselves in in less physical and more spiritual, we would think it would be the holiday of Shavuot. And yet, out of the three holidays that everyone agrees a person has to involve themselves physically, is the holiday of Shavuot. This seems to be counterintuitive. It seems to be a paradox that needs to be answered. What's the explanation behind this? Before we explain this, let us go take a look at a fascinating Midrashic account that we, under, that we learn when it came to the time of Moshe, Moses going up to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah, the Medrash tells us a fascinating episode. We're going to condense it in the, in, in the 
because of the time constrictions. But the story goes as follows. Moshe dis- ascends to the heavens and he says, I came for the Torah. God, I'm here to receive the Torah to give to the Jewish people. And there are a bunch of angels that surround Moshe and they say, what's this human being doing over here? Why is he coming to take the Torah from us? And God says to Moshe, so to speak, Moshe, answer the angels. Answer them. So Moshe says to the angels, let's open up the Torah and take a look. What does it say in the Torah? And he starts reading from the Torah. It says, for example, he says, I am God. Do not have other gods. He turns to the angels and he says, do you have other gods? Do you have a desire to worship other gods? Let's take a look at another of the Ten Commandments. It says, honor your mother and father. Do you have parents that require honoring? Another of the Ten Commandments. It says, six days a week you shall work, and on the seventh day, Shabbat, day of rest. Do you work six days a week? Is that something that you do, you angels? And this went on and on, until eventually the angels said, Moshe, we agree, it's yours. And with that, Moshe was able to take the Torah and give it over to the Jewish people. The question is, over here, what was this dialogue that was going on? Did the angels really think that the Torah belongs to them? The angels knew that they don't have parents. The angels knew that they don't work. So what exactly was the debate and the dialogue going on between Moshe and the angels? The answer is as follows. The Torah is a divine document. The Torah is the Word of God. In fact, the Talmud tells us elsewhere that God created the world using the Torah as the blueprint for creation, meaning the Torah preceded the creation of the world. Now what that means is a little hard for us to understand because we see the Torah as a narrative of things that have happened historically, and how could that have happened? How could that have been written before history happened? The answer is, in short, is that the Torah could have been rearranged in many different arrangements. The letters could, could be arranged into different words, but it would be a spiritual document. The angel's point was, this is a divine document. This is the Word of God. This does not belong in the hands of human beings with their frailties and with their shortcomings, that they should have a chance to take this divine document and to screw it up, to mess around with it, to to, to trip up. They said this belongs over here in heaven. Angels don't do wrong. Angels can have the divine document. To that, God said, Moses, answer them. Moses said, let's look at this divine document. The divine document says, honor your parents, work six days a week. The Torah addresses things that are for physical beings. The point that Moshe was making is, the Torah is, is, yes, indeed, a divine and spiritual document. But the reason that God has created the Torah, and what God wants with the Torah, is to give it to mankind, to human beings, with our shortcomings, with our frailties, because what God wanted, through the vehicle of the Torah, is to take a physical world that we live in, and to infuse it with spirituality, and to elevate it into a spiritual existence. Through the vehicle of the Torah, we can take a physical world and live a spiritual life. Let's take, uh, imagine two people that sit down to eat a meal. Two people sit down to eat the same exact food. One person, a five-course meal. One person is eating his food. Right next to him is another person eating his food. The one person sits down to eat, no intention other than, this is a great meal, digs in and starts eating. The other person sits down, he says, wait, before I eat, I have to make a blessing. So he makes a blessing. After, he washes his hands before he eats bread, because that's the mitzvah, sanctify your hands. He invites perhaps a poor person to come who doesn't have what to eat, and he invites him to come eat with him. After the meal, he makes more blessings, thanking God for the food. Maybe during the meal, he shares a Torah thought, discusses some words of Torah. The, the Talmud says that if somebody eats a meal like that, it's not eating a meal, It's as if he brought an offering on the altar in the temple. He elevated this meal to an offering on the altar in the temple. So two people sitting next to each other. One person was exactly, uh, he was basically, he was a cow. He did nothing other than eat, satisfy his needs, and move on. And the other person offered an offering on the temple by eating his lunch. And the truth is this goes on through everything in the day. Anything a person does, all of their physical activities can be infused and elevated into a spiritual way as long as a person has the right intention and knows what they're doing. They're doing this to serve God. I'm doing this to make myself a better person. That was the essence of the Torah, and that is why God wanted to give us the Torah, to make mankind, in living in a physical world, 
infuse every aspect of our physicality and turn it into a spiritual endeavor. And with that, Moses was able to succeed in triumph over the angels. And that's why he was able to bring the Torah down. So let's circle back for a moment to the original question. Why is it that out of the three holidays, everyone agrees that the one holiday that requires physical indulgence is Shavuot? We said it seems to be a paradox. It didn't seem to make sense. The answer now is very simple. It makes plenty of sense because we are drilling into ourselves the lesson of what Shavuot and the Torah represent. And that is, we human beings received a divine gift, the document of the Word of God, the instruction manual for life. Why? So that we can live in this physical world and turn it into a spiritual endeavor by every action that we do. That means if you go to work in the morning, you can go to work because you want to earn money, because you want to pay for your bills and you want to take vacations. Or you can go to work because you want to support a family so that you can serve God. And you can eat a meal so that you can be healthy so you can serve God. And you can get clothing for your children and get them dressed, either because it's my responsibility as a parent, or because, look, there's these helpless people that need me, they're counting on me to get them dressed, to give them, to provide them with everything. This is a godly act. Everything that we do in life, you can go to the gym and you can say, I'm doing this because I want to feel good. Or you're doing this because I want to be healthy so that I could serve God better. You can go on vacation. So either that you can enjoy yourself or so that you can be able to reinvigorate yourself, to make yourself stronger so that you can serve God better. Every single act that you do, from the moment you wake up in the morning till you go to sleep at night, 24-7, 365 days a year, your entire lifetime, you can take every act and transform it into something spiritual. And therefore, on Shavuot specifically, when we receive the Torah, everyone agrees you have to involve in some physical pursuit. Sit down to a meal. Remember, what is the focus of this meal? Is it just to get hung, to full, fill myself and to make myself feel good? No, it's that I can take my meal and turn it into an offering on the altar. That's the lesson of Shavuot. And perhaps we can conclude with a thought that occurred to me this morning. There's a, there's a passage in the Talmud that says that there was a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Yossi. And Rabbi Yossi on Shavuot would make a very lavish celebratory meal. And he would say that on the holiday of Shavuot, I have to make this celebration. Why? Because, as the Talmud says, if not for this day, how many Yossis would be walking around the marketplace? Simply understood, this means, that this rabbi was saying, if not for the day of Shavuot, where the Jewish people, we received the Torah that transformed me into the sage that I am, so I would be, as we say in English, your average Joe. You know, it's a nice, it's, it actually works out well because his name in, in English will be translated to Joe. So if not for the day of, Torah, of the Shavuot, if not for the Torah, <laughs> how many average Joe, I would be like any average Joe walking around the marketplace. That's the simple understanding. But perhaps with this thought we can say as follows. He specifically said how many Yossis would be walking around the marketplace. The marketplace is the symbol of physicality. It's where you go to work. It's where you engage in commerce. That is my physical existence. Not in the shul. It's not the base medrash where I'm studying, the study hall. It's the physical place. Said Rabbi Yossi, if not for Shavuot, my time in the market would be a regular physical existence. But I'm making a celebration by virtue of the fact that through the Torah, through Shavuot and the receiving of the Torah, even my time in the marketplace, I'm not your average Joe in the marketplace. I'm surrounded by thousands of people in the marketplace. We're all engaged in commerce, but they're all doing business for their own physical reasons. I'm involved in the marketplace. I'm involved in commerce and in, in business in my physical pursuits only as a means to become a better spiritual person. And for that, I can attribute it to the receiving of the Torah and to Shavuot. And therefore, he made a special celebratory feast on Shavuot commemorating the gift of Shavuot. So as we head into the holiday, let's remember this. As we go through our daily lives, we're going to be celebrating the giving of the Torah, which has such an impact on our lives, but we don't even realize what an unbelievable impact it has on every minute detail of every daily act that we do. We can transfer, transform our physical acts, every single one of them, into a completely spiritual one. Have a Chag Sameach. Wow, thank you, Rabbi Kovel. That was a, a, very, a very special message um, and one that I personally really relate to. Um, for me, Shavuos is really about, you know, bringing spirituality in, in very much into a physical, in, into our physical world, into our physical space, and elevating that. And that's really, that's, that's really, to me, 
such a deep message because we have the ability, we have the singular ability to take otherwise mundane things and really elevate them into an entirely different plane. And that's, that, that's really an incredible, an incredibly empowering message that we can take, that each one of us can take with us um, as, we, as, we, as we work through our day and as we work through our, our struggles and our triumphs um, as, 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 we, as, we, as we continue to grow as people and as, holy, as the holy nation of Hashem. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Rabbi, Rabbi Friedner. Rabbi Arya Friedner is also, I mean, this is, this is like the all-star cast. What can I say? Uh, Rabbi Friedner is also an incredible friend. He's also been so helpful. We have the annual Sukkot minion in Rabbi Friedner's Sukkah. Um, right, right on the corner of uh, East Carroll and, and Green. It's Mamish. It's, it's. I'm sure you. If you haven't been, I'm sure you've heard it as, as you've walked to and from Shul. Um, it's really a special, a special, uh, special treat. And Ray Friedner is, is the uh, has, has just founded a, a, a an organization called Torah Institute Beyond Campus, um, in which he which he works with college students to to bring. Torah to them beyond the traditional confines of a college campus. Um, without uh, without any further introduction, Rabbi Rabbi Friedner, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, AJ, and thanks to all the other speakers. It's amazing to be a part of this incredible group. Last year we did this on Shavuos. To do it before Shavuos is perhaps even more appropriate, as we'll see. Thanks to Rabbi Landis for setting up all the the technical video work. It's great to be here. Um, in my fourth year studying in Israel, I was taking an outreach training course, an educational course, and I started to consider when am I eventually going to leave to go back to America to work for the Jewish community. It was definitely a passion of mine that was growing in my years in Israel. And one of my uh, rabbis slash colleagues in the yeshiva, who was the head recruiter, was an amazing guy, and he was incredibly devoted to living in the land of Israel. And I knew that when he was recruiting overseas in America, he was cool, he was good looking, or he is good looking, and I, I was sure that people were throwing opportunities in his direction to work in America. So I told him, I know you have no intent on leaving Israel, but I actually want to go and do community work one day. Do me a favor and keep your eyes open for me, and one day maybe you'll find for me an opportunity. I didn't expect that the very next week, or within a couple of weeks, an opportunity fell into my lap. I had the opportunity to move to Cleveland to run NCSY. My plan had been to stay in Israel for a few more years. I didn't expect to go right away. But the truth is, I really wanted to take this job. It was very exciting. So I asked every rabbi I knew. I asked every rabbi I didn't know when I would run into them at, at weddings and engagement parties. And the answer that I got was clear from everyone that I spoke to. Don't go to America. You can teach one day. You'll have a lot of time for that. While you're in Israel, stay here and keep on learning. That's what everybody said to me. But when I spoke to one of my rabbis who I was very close with, I told him, I know that everyone's telling me not to go. But the truth is, I have a deep passion inside of me. I really want to go. And he told me that no one can tell you what your passion is on the inside. And if your heart is telling you that you have to go, then you have to go. And so, I had my answer. I was going to go. But the truth is, even from that very first moment, and for many years afterwards, that decision was still lingering. Was it the right thing to do? I had gotten guidance from everyone that I knew, and everyone had told me to stay. And yet, here I was saying that I should go. I was still uncertain. We were set to leave at the end of that summer, the day after Tisha B'Av. We had already shipped all of our belongings to Cleveland and we sold everything in our house that we couldn't take with us. We waited outside for our cab, our Nesher, and started our journey towards America. I remember that we had an idea to give our daughter some warm milk. We didn't consider that it might not be a good idea doing that for the first time on the hour-long ride from Jerusalem to the airport near Tel Aviv. It didn't take long for that warm milk to come back up and all over us. Now, it was just the nine days, and we shipped most of our belongings to Cleveland. So all we had in our bags was a bunch of dirty clothes that we hadn't laundered in a while. We got to the airport, and we felt gross. We got out of the cab, we took off our bags, and that's when I realized we had left one bag in our apartment, near our apartment in Jerusalem. And not any bag, the bag. We left the bag with our computer, 
all of our identification, our driver's license, our birth certificates, our passports, our credit cards, our marriage license, even our Ksuba was in that bag. I quickly jumped into the next cab and I headed right back towards Jerusalem. And that became, at that moment, the night that was etched in my memory forever, or that was the day that became etched in my memory forever as the day of seven cabs. Here in cab number two, arriving back in Jerusalem around one in the morning, my flight was scheduled to leave at 3 a.m. I got to the apartment and I jumped out of the cab. I looked at the stairwell. In the bottom of the stairwell, I couldn't find the bag. I looked around the building and I couldn't find the bag anywhere. I realized I had no choice, this wasn't going to happen. And I went back into the cab, back up to the airport near Tel Aviv. That was cab number three. When we got to, when I got to the airport, my wife and I begged El Al to somehow figure out how to let us on. My mother-in-law was trying to fax some old identification documents and they were, we saw them coming in at the back, the door closed, the door opened. We couldn't figure anything out until it was too late. The gate was closed and the flight left. And we thought that maybe God was telling us some kind of a message. Maybe this decision of leaving, because everyone had told us not to go, maybe it was wrong. We looked at each other, but we didn't say anything. Now cab number four, back to Jerusalem. We don't get to our apartment back until around 5 a.m. And I already dropped our key of the apartment into the mailbox of the landlord who weren't there anymore. So I had to break the mailbox open, take the key out just to get into our apartment with no furniture in it so we could sleep for an hour. I didn't want to shove all the bags up the stairs and the Makola across the street was open. So we brought all of our big bags for this flight to America into the Makola and we left it there. We told the Makola guy everything that was going on. He felt terrible for us. And we, we called the police and we filed a report because we figured we live on an alley that enters right into town and it's very likely that the bag was stolen. So after an hour of sleep, we went into town and we got our pictures for our passports and we got all the documents prepared, prepared because we had to now get a new passport. We go back to our apartment building and there is Yaakov, the Makolet guy, and our neighbors across the street and everyone's waving their arms and screaming at us. Something about the police, the Mishtara. Now we didn't understand what was happening, but we thought maybe someone had found our bag. In the middle of the commotion, as we're trying to understand them yelling at us, a police car is driving towards the street in our direction. And the Makolet guy jumps in front of the police car and waves him down and he yells at them. Them. Do you find it? Did you find the bag? And the policeman said, what bag? You lost the bag? And he said, yeah, a bag. So the policeman said, what color is the bag? And he said, it's a black bag. So the policeman reached back into the back of the car and he pulled out a different black bag, some kind of a backpack. And everyone, all of my neighbors on the street had this big sigh of frustration. That wasn't it. But we had our information for our passports. So we jump into cab number Five. Okay. Cab number five. We go to the Jerusalem Embassy. Now, in those days, the Jerusalem Embassy was in the Arab area, so it was a little bit more scary for us. And we get on line, and it takes us a couple of hours to speak to anybody. We finally get to the front of the line, and we tell them what happened, and they say, okay, well, we'll process it. We'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. An hour later, they call us back, and they say, I'm really sorry to tell you, but we're only allowed to issue three emergency passports every day. And we just issued our third emergency passport. We can't help you. So I, I, was, I was yelling, I was almost crying. We have to go back, our flights tonight. They're not gonna push it off again. So they say, sit down, we'll try to figure it out. Another hour goes by in the embassy. And they call me back and they say, I really can't help you, but they might have one passport left in the embassy in Tel Aviv. So if you go back up north, they can get you a passport. So my wife and I hop into another cab. Now we're on cab number six and we're in shock. We're in total silence. We can't believe this whole day. We're going up to Tel Aviv about a half hour into the ride. I get a phone call. Now I'm nervous. I reach down and I pick up my phone. I say, hello. And the voice on the other line says, the bad news is they don't have any more passports in Tel Aviv. The good news is if you come back to the Jerusalem embassy, I think we can give you one. So I told the cab driver to stop and turn around. And I looked at my wife and I said, Alyssa, if one more thing happens today, we're not getting on that plane. And she nodded. 
Cab number seven took us back to the airport that evening. And thank God nothing else bad happened. We made it onto the plane and we made it to Cleveland. And during this entire episode and for a lot of my life since then, I've had to face my own thoughts. Was God trying to tell us something that day? Was he trying to tell us that we shouldn't leave Israel? It made sense. All the rabbis said that I had to stay. Everything was going against what I was trying to accomplish. But I ended up convincing myself, and I think this is true, that I did the right thing. I was supposed to go to Cleveland. How could I tell myself that? Because maybe all of those things that came my way were there to test me. Maybe I had to have the opportunity to turn around just so that I would say no. I know that I want to do this. I know this is the right thing. And once I made that clear decision and my heart had really built up an incredible desire, then Hashem took away the obstacles. But even then, I wasn't really sure. Did I do the right thing? Was God leading me in that direction somehow even with the obstacles or did He want me to turn around? We know the story of Yonah Hanavi. Yonah the prophet gets a message from Hashem Go to Nineveh and tell the community, tell the non-Jewish community of Nineveh that they have to repent and turn back to Hashem. And we know the story that Yonah ran away and he ended up in a whale. And that was bound to fail, as the rhyme says. How are we supposed to understand this story that Yonah simply didn't listen to Hashem and ran away? The Midrashim explain that Yonah actually thought he was doing the right thing. Because he had calculated that if he goes to Nineveh and the non-Jewish people repent and the Jewish people in Israel don't repent, it's going to look very bad for the Jewish people. So Yonah felt that what he was supposed to do was to run away and not listen to Hashem and sacrifice for himself and his relationship with God for the sake of the Jewish people to save them. The Medrash says that when Yonah went to the dock, the port, to get on that boat to Tarshish, away from Israel. The boat had just left. And the man at the dock told Yonah that the boat to Tarshish only goes once a year. You're going to have to wait 365 days to get on the next boat. Just then, the man looks out and he sees that that boat to Tarshish had turned around and came back to the dock. And he said, you must be a man of God and you must be destined to get on this boat. Because I've been at this dock my whole life and I've never seen this boat turn around and come back. It must be you have to get on it. So Yona knew. Yona knew he was right. God was sending him a sign. He was supposed to run away. We know that didn't happen. But is that fair? If Yona wasn't supposed to run away, how could God make it so easy for him to decipher something as a sign that he was doing the right thing? If God can sometimes push us towards a direction that we want to go in, even if it's not right, then how are we supposed to move forward? And if God can put an obstacle in our path, and sometimes it means we have to turn back, but sometimes it means we have to step over it, then how are we supposed to know how to do anything? How do we decipher the signs that we get from Hashem? And why would we even ask for a sign if it wouldn't help us? The truth is, we're always going to feel a need to follow our hearts. And the Holy Nitziv said that that's actually the right thing to do. It says in Koheles, that you have to go in the path that your heart shows you. The Nitziv said that wherever your heart pulls you is a sign that you know internally that that's what your neshama needs. So you have to follow your heart. Ultimately, signs in one direction or the other. A person is going to do and should do what their heart tells them. So if we're always going to follow our heart, and that's the right thing to do, so then how are we possibly supposed to know what the right thing to do is? I should know that my heart is really leading me in the right direction? This weekend is the day that Hashem gives the Jewish people the Torah. But the name of this Yom Tov is Shavuos, Shavuos, Shavuot, which means weeks. It's in reference to the seven weeks that we've been waiting and counting towards this holy day. But why do we call the name of the holiday itself the thing that which we've been doing to prepare for the holiday? Weeks. The weeks beforehand get the name of the holiday itself? Why would we do that? The Sfarim say because the light of the Torah comes down through preparation. So the day itself that we've been waiting for, 
the day that Hashem gave us the Torah, is equivalent to all the days beforehand that we were preparing to get that Torah. The day is Shavuos, those weeks beforehand. They're the same thing. We say in Shema v'haya, im shama tishmu el mitzvosai. That it will be that if you listen to these mitzvos, Asher Anochi Mitzavcha Hayom, that I give you today, Al Livavecha, on your heart. The message in Shema is that the mitzvos that Hashem gives us, we have to put onto our heart. When we're learning Torah, we are building in our hearts a reservoir of an understanding of what it means to be a Jew, what it means to follow the blueprint of life, the real signs of Hashem of how we're supposed to move forward with the big decisions and the small decisions. When we learn Torah, when we put Torah onto our hearts, then we can trust our hearts to lead us in the direction towards Hashem. Rav Biederman says it's important to remember that the actual preparation that we do the weeks before Shavuos is counting day one, day two, day three, that's it. It doesn't even have to be anything significant. And we have to understand this, that to be a person that can make a Torah decision, you don't have to have some extreme, incredible amount of Torah knowledge. It's about one daf of Gemara after one daf of Gemara. It's about one Mishnah by one Mishnah. One Pasuk after one Pasuk. Learning Torah little by little alavavcha and putting it onto your heart will surely lead you so that your heart will show you the path towards Hashem. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of this. Have a great Shavuos. Shavuos and AJ, back to you. Oh, thank you, Rabari. Such beautiful words. Really, um, you know, words that come from the heart enter the heart. So definitely follow your heart, listen to the Eivishter and the Mitzvah Shem. We will um, have a beautiful Shuas, so much more inspired by your very special words. Now, um, for Rabbi Landis, who, is, who needs no introduction, his, uh, his incredible work is, is, is incredibly, um, his impact is, is incredibly felt in our town. Um, since he's lived here, we, we are both uh, former residents of the uh, Shar Beis Hamikdash, and uh, and uh, you know since moving to Cleveland, he's founded Partners in Torah here, and and, and uh, he's involved with social media. He's a, he's a social media whiz, and he's an incredible tech whiz as well. So definitely reach out to him with all of your tech problems. He will turn them into tech solutions, and. Uh, He's also an incredible Torah Anytime orator. Um, definitely get his daily dose. It will set you straight for the day. Um, and, and unfortunately, it seems like uh, he's been, he's, he was, he was too, too good to be true for this world. So Facebook has uh, currently incarcerated him. It's, a, it's really a very terrible situation. Um, it's, it's, we're making a joke about it, but it's, it's truly unfortunate that, that for sharing Torah and for really spreading awareness of the Holocaust that Rabbi, Rabbi Landis has been, has been really um, censored by Facebook. Um, and so at this point, I think we're really just about advocating and get, getting the word out that this is not an okay thing. And we hope that Rabbi Landis's sentence gets uh, commuted and that he gets pardoned. So without any further uh, delay. We gotta gotta get him out of jail. Here are the ones. Thank you very much. Okay, gotta get ready uh, for this quarantine program here and keep everything sanitized so that we uh, do things the right way. It's very very important. So oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let me just get cleaned up here a little bit, and we'll be ready to share some words of Torah. Hold on one second, let's put that over there. Okay. Oh, I don't know what this is for, but anyhow. Okay, thank you all for tuning in to this wonderful program tonight, and thank you to all the presenters who joined with us to bring you 613, six presentations, each one of about 13 minutes. And I have the privilege of sharing with you an idea that has bothered me for years. In fact, if you're used to hearing me speak, you might have even heard me talk about it before. There's a very famous section in the Talmud, a very famous Gemara that talks about Shavuos, that talks about the Yantiv that we're going to have in just a few days. Dare I say it's probably one of the most famous Gemaras referencing Shavuos, unless you haven't heard it yet, and then it's completely not famous at all. Beers and May, the Gemara tells us, Kofalam Har that when the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai, 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Almighty, held Mount Sinai over their head like a barrel. And the Almighty says to the Jewish people, in the Kabbalah, if you accept the Torah, Multav, everything will be fine. And if you don't accept the Torah, Shem Tia Kivaraschem, there will be your grave. And then the Gemara goes on back and forth with a halachic argument saying that the Jews were actually coerced into accepting the Torah. That's what we see from the story. And since the Jews were coerced, they can't really ever be held accountable for anything that they do. And the Gemara goes back and forth a little bit and eventually comes to the conclusion that this is a moot point nowadays because at the time of Purim, Kimu Vakiblu. Kimu ma shekiblu kavar. At the time of Purim, the Jewish people accepted that they upheld that which they had accepted before. Kiblu ma she, kimu ma shekiblu kavar. They upheld that which they accepted before. Okay. This Gemara makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, not one word of it. First of all, let's start at the beginning. The Gemara tells us that the Almighty held Mount Sinai over the heads of the Jews like a barrel. Now usually when you extend a parable or a mushal as we call it onto a story, when you uh, extend a metaphor onto a story, the goal is to bring out a point, to bring out how intense the situation is. So last time I checked, it is pretty darn scary to have a mountain hanging over your head and it is not too scary to have a barrel hanging over your head. So why in the world does the Talmud tell us that the mountain, this huge piece of granite, was held over their heads like a barrel? Just say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu held the mountain over their heads like a mountain, and I get the whole situation just fine. That's question number one. Question number two, what exactly does the Gemara mean when it says, that if you don't accept the Torah, Shem Tiekiraschem, implying that if the Jewish people were not to accept the Torah at Mount Sinai, Hashem would have dropped Mount Sinai on their heads, and what would have happened? Shem Tiekiraschem, there would be their grave. Well, last time I checked, if you were to drop a mountain onto somebody's head, they would, they would die right here. So it shouldn't say, Shalom Tiyak Raschem, there will be your grave. It should say, Po Tiyak Raschem, here will be your grave. In other words, if you, the Jewish people, says the Almighty, do not accept the Torah, I will drop this mountain on your head, smashing you right here, making this your grave. That is question number two. And question number three, what exactly changed at the time of Torah to make this whole, I'm sorry, what exactly changed at the time of Purim to make this whole entire conversation moot? Okay, so question number one, why in the world are we comparing the mountain to a barrel? Question number two, if you drop a mountain on someone's head, they will usually die where you drop the mountain. Why does the Gemara say there will be your grave as if to say that somewhere else will be where they will perish? And question number three, what was corrected at the time of Purim to, so to speak, remove the coercion that was going on in this story before us? Okay. So to understand this Gemara, first of all, we have to understand the Medrash Tan Chuma. The Medrash Tan Chuma tells us that we actually have a whole nother issue over here, and that is that we see in the written words of the Torah that when the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai, they said, Na'asev Nishma. They said, we will do and we will listen. As if to say, God, we accept it and we'll get the details later. Now we have this section of the Gemara that says, no, they were coerced. So which one was it? Nasev and Ishma, we willingly accept, or we have to be coerced. The Medrash Chuma reconciles this issue to tell us that the Jewish people said, Nasev and Ishma, said we will willingly accept the Torah, specifically the written Torah. God, we have no problem. Give us a book that's very esoteric, that's very hard to understand, that's absolutely incomprehensible without some sort of commentary or explanation. We'll take the book, and you know what? We'll be fine with it. We'll figure out on our own what we want to do. We'll read the words. We'll interpret it the way we want to interpret it. And that's all fine. Nase Venishma. But when the Almighty said, no, that's not how it works. The Almighty said, I have a system that's going to come with the book. We have the concept of Torah Shabbat al -Peh. We have the concept that in every generation, you'll have scholars and rabbinical leaders that'll tell you exactly how to understand the words of the book. 
on that that you said, I'm not sure we're so ready for this. I mean, if those could be up to us, now it's of Nishma. But once you're telling us we have to like listen to the rabbis, we have to like listen to somebody else, we can't make our own decisions, you're gonna infringe on my personal space and my personal rights. At that point, the Jews said, I'm not sure. So at that point, what happens? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you know what? That's fine. You wanna do it your way? So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna pick up this mountain and hold it over your head like a barrel. And if you accept the Torah the way that I tell you you need to accept it, with the written Torah and the concept of the Torah Shabal Peh, the oral tradition that's going to come along with it, then we are going to be fine. But if not, we're going to have an issue. You know what the issue is? Let me explain it to you like this. If you're anything like me, you appreciate a good bottle of bourbon. And you know that every good bottle of bourbon starts off in a barrel of bourbon. Because what in the world is a barrel used for? No, they're not only using Donkey Kong for the big gorilla to throw them down the building to knock people over. No, a barrel is the quintessential vehicle to be able to store something in. It's the quintessential thing that you put things into when you want to store them. So the Almighty was saying to the Jewish people, if you're going to take the written Torah and you're going to do whatever you want with it and you're going to make your own explanations and you're going to make your own interpretations and you're going to do it in the way that makes sense for you, you know what? It'll be great for you. It'll make sense for you. It'll work for you. And then you know what's going to happen after that? We're going to take it and we're going to put it into a nice barrel and we're going to put it over into the storage silo and it is going to last all of one generation because you're going to form it in a way that makes perfect sense for your generation. And then you know what happens when the next generation comes along? They're going to do something totally different and they're going to look up at you on the shelf sitting in that barrel and say, oh yeah, that's how my dad did it. Oh yeah, that's how my mom did it. We do it totally different. We have a totally different thing that we follow over here because we interpret the way we want to interpret. And you know what's going to happen then? Shum Tiekrashem. There, when we take that barrel that you have fortified yourself into, and we put it up on the shelf, and the next generation comes along to do the same exact thing, Shum Tiekrashem. There will be your grave. So, what exactly changed at the time of Purim? At the time of Purim, we see an absolutely crazy story. We see that the Jews have basically given up hope of returning to the land of Israel and building the second temple. And we see that there's one Jew named Mordechai who stands up and tells the Jewish people that they are wrong. That they cannot give up hope. They cannot bow to the, they cannot bow to the idols of Haman. And all the Jews say, you know what, political expendency, uh, I, I got to do what I got to do, we got to go to the party of Achashosh, we have to, you know, this is what we have to do, like this is, this is Persia circa 350 before the common era, like this is what you got to do in these days to be a Jew in Persia. Mordechai said, you are all wrong. And then the story twists and it turns and it goes upside down and inside out. Everything gets flipped on his head until the end with what happens. Mordechai, the rabbi, the rabbi that everybody said was wrong. The rabbi who said that was, they were, that was the crazy old Jew from Jerusalem. That rabbi comes out, Belavush Malchus, wearing the royal robes. And they see, wow, you know what? Mordechai was right. The rabbi was right. And had we... Had we been on our own, and had he not been here to stand up and do something to wake us up, we'd be goners. So at that point, the Jews said, you know what? Maybe it's not great to interpret things the way that we understand it. Maybe we do need the ideas of the Torah Shabal Ped, the ideals of the oral tradition that are passed down from generation to generation, from Moses on down to the scholars in every generation to tell us how the Torah implies, how the Torah applies in our generation. Because without this scholarship, without this understanding of the Torah, we are just going to end up in the barrels, God forbid, sitting on the shelf, and Shum Tiekavraschem, there will be our grave. And dare I say, Judaism and Jewish history has proven this point time and time again. In every single generation, we always have an element that says, we stick with Torah's Moshe. We stick with the Torah of Moses. We stick with the idea that there's both a Torah Shebe Xav, there's both a written Torah and a Torah Shebaal Peh, and an oral Torah. And even though they're often mute, 
even though they're often, uh, they don't have the numbers with them, even though they often are of a small population, that is always the group that survives from generation to generation. Yet there's other groups who come along, and they come with sound and splendor, and they come with all the numbers, and they often have the aristocracy of Judaism, and they have the money of Judaism, and they have the majority of the people of Judaism, and they form groups like those who worship the Baal and the times of the kings, and like the Tzedukim, like the Messiah name in the time of the Hanukkah story, and then like the Tzedukim, the Sadducees after that, and then like the Karaites after that, and they have all kinds of power and all the numbers, and you think this is completely taken over Judaism. And then there's always a few rabbis who come along to fight it. Like Elijah the prophet in his time, like Rav Sajigon in his time, like Maimonides in his time, and they come and say, no, this is not the approach of Moshe Rabbeinu. This is not the approach of what the Jews were given at Mount Sinai and confirmed at the time of Purim. And those groups that have so much power and money and numbers, they flitter and they float away and they just last for that generation and then they climb into their proverbial barrel and get on the shelf and we see the situation of Sham Tia Kvaraschem. As we head into the Yantav of Shavuos, we refer to it as Zman Matan Torah This is the time of the acceptance of the Torah. This is our annual rejuvenation for Torah learning, our annual rejuvenation for our connection to the Torah. Let's all make a commitment wherever and however we're going to be connecting with the holiday of Shavuos to understand that the Torah is a package. The Torah is something that comes from the Almighty. It's the words and the understanding of the Almighty for how we in this world can turn around and have a relationship with Him. But we have to understand that the relationship is not on our terms. We can't say to the Almighty, Almighty, God, we'll tell you what you want from us. No, he's already made it very, very, very clear from time immemorial. And that's the Judaism that stood the test of time and been here for 3,500 years since that first time when the Jews stood at Mount Sinai. And every other approach to try and do it the way every generation wanted to do it, they came with sound and splendor, and now they're just sitting in a barrel in a situation of Sham Tia Kvraschem. I would like to wish you all a Chag Sameach and a good Yantiv. Thank you, Rabbi Landis. Those, those, were, those were very special words. Um, in many ways, I feel like we're still holding in, in, in the times of Purim. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but uh, we've been getting Mishloch Manas from our kids' teachers. Uh, we've been giving Mishloch Manas. You know, the Nigan Minion's been giving us stuff out. I'm sure you've been on the giving and receiving end. Of, of Mishlach Manas ever since Purim, it's, it's, it feels like it's, we're still in Purim. It's also kind of, uh, I feel like we're all still dressing up. We're all still wearing, you know, we're all still wearing masks. We just haven't, we haven't been able to get over that. And some, somehow it still feels like we're stuck in Pesach because on Pesach everybody has different uh, customs and minhagim on what they can eat and do eat and where they can go and, you know, where they can be invited to. So it's still a very confusing time. So I'm, thank you so much for providing such deep clarity. Um, to, to us and uh, allowing us to uh, really cut through all that and see and see 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 uh, see such deep meaning and special insight into Shuas. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and now on to we will um, have the privilege of hearing from Rabbi Spiro. Rabbi Spiro is a uh, an, an incredibly deep um, lecturer. He he also works with uh, he he works with Rabbi Landis at uh, you guys you guys podcast together at uh, Today in Jewish History, which is uh, actually a fascinating uh, a fascinating um, journey, if you will. It's what got Rabbi Landis into uh, into Facebook jail, though, so it definitely has a dark side. And uh, <laughs> but um, but Rabbi Spiro and Rabbi Landis are partners in crime. They uh, they definitely love eighty sports as a, as a, as I have discovered. Uh, clearly, I, I have no clue about any of that. Not leave it to Rabbi Spear to drop some names for you. If you'd like, you can you can talk shop with him. Um, but without 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 any further introduction, Rabbi Spiro is is here to share 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 with us some deep words about about uh, our Queen Mother. Good evening. It is almost Shulis and. There's a old Minig Yisrael to read Megillus Rus on Shavuos. This Minig is mentioned in the Medrash. We can assume the, the Minig is minimally 1700, 1800 years old. 
Masech Seifram brings it down. Masech Seifram actually says that we make a bracha when we, when we read, read Megillus Rus, which is not the minig of most people, but it's minig agra. So in any case, Megillus Rus is tied in, is linked in 100% with the Yantav of Shavuos. The question is why? So I want to go through a few reasons here that could maybe help us understand what the connection between Rus and Shavuos is, and really, in general, what the connection, what we can learn from Sefer Rut, from Megillus Rus. Megillus Rus is my favorite of the, all the Sefer Tanakh, just on a personal level, but it's such a beautiful Sefer. So let's go through a few ideas. Number one, if you look at the beginning of, of Megillus Rus, it says, V'shem ha'ish alimelech v'shem ishto nami. It's the ma- name of the man was Elimelech, his wife's name was Nami, Shem Shnei Bondov, Machlon, Vechel, Yon, and Fersayim. Machlon and Kain of, uh, they, they were, they, 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 they were of nobility, Mibes Lechem, Yudav, Vayvosh, Teimo, Vayusham. They came to Teimo and they were there. Vayamos, Elimelech, Ishnami. And Elimelech, Ishnami died. Vatayishaher, he Ushnei Vanea. And she was alone with her two sons. Very interesting expression. It just mentions who was married, who, 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 who the family was. They moved to Mayav. And then it says, Alimelech dies and Nami is alone with her two sons. First of all, it's obvious, right? Who, who else would she be with? So there's an interesting question. Why did Alimelech decide to move to Mayav in the first place? This is in a time, nowadays, a, a Jew moves. We have Jews in six of seven, seven continents. So a Jew now says, I got a job in South Africa. Or I got a job in Australia. That's not considered strange. In this time, right before, it was before the building of the first base of Mikdash, every Jew lived in Eretz Yisrael. So Elimelech had a good reason. He, he knew that to bring Moab into the Jewish people was a prerequisite for the coming of Mashiach. Nonetheless, he did something very dangerous. What did he do that was so dangerous? He cut himself off from the Tzibor. He cut himself off from the community. And this Pasuk reflects it over here. Vayama Salimelech, Salimelech died, Ish Nami, the husband of Nami, Vatisha'er, he Ushnei Vanah. All that was left was her and her two sons. In other words, Elimelech, had they lived in Eretz Yisrael, a person lives part of a community when they die, there's a mourning process. People come and, would come and sit Shiva. Right, Midaraisa, a person with Sitshiva would mourn for one day. Midarabana, there's there are six other days we add on, but there is a certain mourning process that we go through, and a person doesn't go through the mourning process alone. However, because Ali Melech left Eretz Yisrael and his family left Eretz Yisrael, even though they had good intentions, the reality was they were separated from the Tzibor, they were separated from the community, from the congregation, and they lost that Tzchusat Tzibor. And the only piece of people mourning for Ali Melech was his wife and his two children. This is the first lesson of Megillus Rus, that if a person wants to join into Klai Yisrael, wants to become part of Klai Yisrael, one of the things they must remember is they are part of a community. And you see, when Nami and Rus were coming back, and they were, and Nami was alluding to, to Rus, the different things she needs, she said, Am, Rus said back to Nami, Amech Ami, your people are my people. What was the specific obligation she was referring to. Some say there was no specific obligation. She was saying, I will take on the aspects of the Jewish people. I will be joined with the community of Kala Yisrael. That's the first thing, Tzibor. The second idea that we can learn from is, this is actually a Medrash Nyaka Shemaini that, that we know, and it's a, it's a Gemara Masech, this Brachas, that Tyra Niknes be Yisur, and a person acquires Tyra through hardship, like anything good in life. A person wants to have a built-up buff body, such as I do, right? What do they have to do? They have to work hard, hours and hours in the gym, and eating, eating protein shakes, doing all the, all, all the right things that a person should do to look like this. If a person wants, wants to have money, they have to work at it. Anything good, a person wants to be a great baseball player, a person wants to be great at playing the harp. It's unknown if this is a harp or a lyre. There's still a big machalikas in my family. A person wants to be great at that. What do they have to do? They have to put a lot of hours, a lot of practice, and put a lot into it. Tyra is the same thing. So how do we see that by Nami? If you look at who Nami was, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, by Rus, how do we see that by Rus? You look at who Rus was. Rus was, it's a machalikas, was she the daughter of Eglon, the king of Mayav? Or was, Tyra says she was actually a granddaughter of Mayav, in either, of Eglon, the king of Mayav. Either case, she was raised in the palace. She was raised in royalty. Yet someone who's raised in royalty is willing to come to Eretz Yisrael and not just follow her mother-in-law to Eretz Yisrael. She's willing to follow her mother to Eretz Yisrael, and how will she get food? She will crawl on the floor to get food. Right? We know that the, 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 the Megillah tells us that, that they would go out for the midst of pe- Leka, Chicha, and Peya, that Peyaz would, would, would leave, or any of the farmers would leave the corners of their field, and, and they're forgotten. She's in their, she's in their field, and, and they would pick them up, and that's how they would eat. Meaning, in other words, she went in her lifetime from being in a, in a palace 
to then g- g- gathering food off the ground. Right? That's Torah Nikhnas be a certain. And she does it the whole time, the Mepharshim say, with a great degree of simcha and a great degree of malchus, of royalty, which leads us into the third thing we can learn from. So the second thing we learn from is good things, particularly Torah, are required through difficulty. The third thing we can learn from is the idea, we said before, that Rus personifies Malchus. Rus is called Imesha Malchus, the mother of kingdom. The Gemara in Bava Basra actually tells us that when Rus had tremendous arichas yamim, when Shlomo HaMelech, her great-great-grandson, was appointed as Melech, she was there to see it. She had, she had a great length of years. And she deserved this length of years and deserved specifically to see both her great-grandson and great-grandson become kings because she personified Malchus. What does Malchus mean? Does Malchus mean external trappings? Does it mean wearing a, a, a heavy robe? Does it mean wearing a crown? Does it mean living in a palace? No, Malchus is a state of mind. It says about Shlomo HaMelech, the great-great-grandson of Rus, it says in the beginning, Shlomo ruled al Yainim and he ruled on the upper world in the lower worlds, then Shlomo HaMelech ruled just on this world, and finally, beside Yamav, Shlomo HaMelech ruled al 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 Shlomo HaMelech ruled on his stick. What does that mean? How do you be a ruler of a stick? Right? The Gemara says, Gemara brings down in Gittin, that Ashmedai, the shade, displaced Shlomo HaMelech for a certain amount of years. That's an interesting story. You look at look the Gemara in Gittin. But the question is, what does it mean? How does someone ruler over a stick? So the answer is, being a Melech, the personification of Malchus, is not a question of status, it's not a question of trappings, not a question of wealth, it's not a question of power. It's internal Mida that every person is able to gain. And Rus personified this Mida. What are the real meanings of Malchus? If you look at the Mepharshim, the real meanings of Malchus are, number one, responsibility. A person who's willing to accept responsibility. If you look at Megillus Rus, we'll get to this, that one of the underlying themes is the idea of responsibility. And number two, the idea of humility. In other words, that a person is able to take the responsibility but also not act arrogantly with this responsibility. David Melech, the great grandson of Rus, when he's coming back after the incident with, Av- with Avshalom, Shemi ben Geira curses him in public. Right? Shemi ben Geira really, even though he actually was the Rebbe of Shlomo HaMelech, Shemi ben Geira deserves to be put to death for this terrible breach, for insult David HaMelech in public. What did that, he cursed him, he, called, he compared him to a dog. What did David HaMelech respond? May Hashem Yatzadav, his words are the words of Hashem. He knew he deserved, he deserved Musa from Hashem. Was Shimi right to give it? No, Shimi in the end was killed for this very Avera later on by Shlomo HaMelech. But the actual words, the bitter words that came out of Shimi's mouth, Shimi was from Sheva Ben Yamin. He was a general bitterness between those, those two Shvatim, Ben Yamin and Yehuda. But it never affected David personally. Why? Because David had the humility with the responsibility. And by the way, the reason, just as a side note, the reason why Moab has to come into Kalah Yisrael, the reason why Moab has to join in with the Jewish people, is I heard from Rabbi Moshe Shapiro many times, the idea of Moab is Malchus Blikas. So Moab is the ultimate idea of responsibility. We see the daughter of, of how did Moab come from? The daughter of Light saw it. there's no one left in the world except for me, my sister, and my father. Therefore, I have to have relations with my father. That shows a level of responsibility. Then she named the child Moab from my father. That's degradation. So in Mayav was this great level of responsibility, but also a great level of degradation. Rus was the person who was able to remove the psilus. She was able to remove the husk. She had the responsibility, but without the degradation. That's why I had to come with the Kala Yisrael. So Ali Melech was not totally wrong. He just did a little bit early. In any case, the next thing we can learn from, from Megillus Rus is... Bayaz, right? Bayaz is his real name. We know is Ivtsan. What is name Ivtsan? Why, if his name was Ivtsan, as the Gemara says in Baba Basra, if you look and say for Shaft, then Bayaz is not mentioned. Just the name Ivtsan. Why is he called Bayaz? Bayaz, to him was strength. Bayaz had an amazing Midah, right? You can imagine who Rus was. Now, I'm going to say something shocking right now, but I think it will help us define who Rus was. Who was Rus? Rus was Ke'ilu, a daughter or granddaughter of someone like Hitler. What does that mean, right? Who was who was Eglin? Eglin was a person who wanted to destroy Klai Yisrael, and in fact was trying to destroy Klai Yisrael, right? Similar to what Hitler did, similar to what the Tsar did, we could, similar to what Stalin did. So we could think of many different examples. But imagine someone like that, their daughter or granddaughter comes to the Klai Yisrael, converts. You can imagine many people saying, "I don't know. For me, she might be a great girl, but for me to be Meshadich with someone, look at her. She's the daughter of Eglin." 
I'm not marrying someone like that. I, she's great. She's a tznua. She's ima shamachas. She has these unbelievable, unbelievable midas. And it's worth your while, whoever can learn Megillus, Rus and Shavuos, to see the greatness of Rus, to, to, to delve into the story. We're just touching upon it now. But at the same time, we could understand why a person would say, I can't do it. I'm not messing up my family. And that's exactly what happened with Plenty of Money. Plenty of Money's real name is Taiv, as the Major tells us. He says, look, I'm sorry. I'm not marrying... I, I refuse to marry this woman. I'll beguile the fields. I'll redeem the fields if you want. But you're going to tell me the fields are tied in with the marriage of Rus? That's not going to happen. Pen Ashley says, Nachalasi, I'll destroy my inheritance. There's no way that I'm marrying someone like that. The Briskorov learned he was worried Sanhedrin would reverse itself and decide later on that really Rus was not allowed to join Kalah Yisrael. But whatever the reasons are, he showed a degree of cowardice. And that's why he's called Plenty on Money. His real name is never mentioned explicitly in Megillus Rus because he displayed cowardice and he did not deserve to have his name mentioned. So the fourth lesson we learned from Megillus Rus is if you're doing the right thing, don't be scared. Don't be scared what other people are going to think about you. And finally, the fifth lesson we're going to learn from Megillus Rus, I'm going to read over an unbelievable medrash. From Medrash Rabbi Rus. Rabbi Bracha kach darsh shnei gedali oilam. So darsh and two gedali oilam. Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Lezer, Aymer. Rabbi Lezer says, Bayaz asa shalai. Listen to these beautiful words. Bayaz did his. Rus asa shala. Rus did hers. Vinami Asa Shala, meaning Bayez did what he needed to do. He was willing to marry Rus. Rus did hers. She was willing to go against her nature to go to Boaz's room in the middle of the night. Nami Asa Shala. Nami was hard for the, the measure says. Nami was a mother of Machlon. Machlon died because of Rus. Right? Now, okay, things had changed, but nonetheless, you can imagine there'd be some bitterness left over, some hesitancy left over. No, Nami did hers. So finally, Amra Kadesh Baruchu. Hashem says, Afani Asesheli, I will do mine. This is the fifth and final lesson from Megillus Rus. If a person does the will of Hashem, if a person does the Rus of Hashem, everything will turn out well in the end. And you look at the end of the, of the Megillah. By the way, Bayez dies the next day. They're married for one day, probably not even one full day. But who, what happens? The Medrash ends off with Zichus. From that relationship that they had that one night came Ayved, Ayved Haylid is Yisha, Yisha Haylid is David. Right? For all generations, the couple that brought the Malchus into Klal Yisrael, they are the parents of Mashiach Tzitkenu, are Bayaz and Rus. Right? And it's again, it's because of this idea, they knew they were doing the Ratzon of Hashem and nothing else stood in the way. So again, let's review the five quick lessons. Number one, make yourself part of the Tzibor. It's very important. Number two, Think great things are required with difficulty, and it's particularly Tyra. Number three, the idea of, of leadership, the idea of Malchus, is not dependent on external trappings. It's within the person itself, in the leadership itself. The Shomah Melech ruled over his stick. He had nothing else in, in, in his life, but he had a stick, and that's sufficient to rule over. Malchus is a personality trait, not a birthright. Number four, a person should not be scared if he's doing the right thing. He shouldn't worry what other people will think about him. And finally, number five, if we do the Ratz and Hashem, everything will work out perfectly in the end. Have a fantastic Shavuos. And don't forget to play your harp. Thank you so much, Rabbi Spiro. Um, those, those, those are very special uh, thoughts you, sh you shared. Thank you so much. And uh, I think that the, uh, the Machleikas, the uh, discussion as to what you have there is called is is truly global um as whether it's called a, a harp or a lyre i think the difference is whether the strings go inside the instrument or whether they are they're strung on top i think that uh, at least some people believe that the uh, david and Malach, i don't know how people uh figure this stuff out but it's well above the, the sphere of where i understand things but some people um believe that that David HaMelech, or in biblical times, they actually, uh, a navel or a chinar is more of a lyre kind of instrument than, than the harp as we know it today. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that and for bringing uh, your beautiful instrument uh, to, uh, to, to our audience. Um, and now, as, 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 our, as our evening draws to a close, um, we'd li I'd like to introduce uh, Hannah Perel Handler, who is uh, who was very ki kind enough to to join us once again, um, she really, you know, um, shared such deep, deep words last year with with all of us, and anyone who was there with us last year was really blown away by what she shared. Such deep and power, such a deep and powerful message, and um, 
I'd like to welcome her back once again. She works um, with, she's a, she's a, uh, she's a counselor. She works with uh, Atidenu, um, and uh, she's been really very kind enough to, to share her time um, and, and, sh and share, some, share some very special words with us. Thank you very much. Without any further ado, uh, Ms. Hamlin, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. It's hard to believe it's been a full year since our last 613 presentation, and I'm so happy to be back. Tonight's topic is called, Yes, It Is All About Me. And I've already gotten some jabs from my friends about the title because there's a running joke um, about how everything really is all about me. They can be calling me in a crisis or in labor, asking me to come watch their kids, and I'll say, oh, I'm so happy you called me on my day off while my ringer was on, while I'm available, and then I can come now. I mean, literally making everything about me. But in all seriousness, when we talk about Hashem and life and the Torah, everything truly is all about us as individuals. And this is not my own narcissism or my own interpretation of reality. Chazal say that. Chazal say that we're all obligated and encouraged to look at our lives with the concept of Bishvili Nivra Ha'olam. The whole world was created for me, for my purpose to serve Hashem, to maximize my life. So what does this mean in practical, everyday life? And how do we actualize this concept, practically speaking? As the last few months have unfolded, I found myself going back to almost exactly 12 years ago from when COVID hit the United States. 12 years ago, Rosh Chodesh Adar, I was in Shana Bet, my second year in seminary in Israel. And I remember the evening so clearly. It was a Thursday night. We had just finished night classes and some girls were packing up for Shabbos and some girls were staying behind to learn a little more. And some girls were going to the Tachanam or Kazit, the central bus station around the block from us. And I remember a few girls coming in about 9 p.m. frantically screaming, crying. They're shooting out there. It's chaos. We don't know what's going on. The street is getting locked down. And that was the evening of the Merka Sarav massacre, where eight Bahrim, ages 16 to 24, were gunned down in the library that evening on Rosh Chodesh while they were studying Torah. And the next day I went to the funeral. That was when I first learned that in Eretz Yisrael, when you bury people, it's in Talisim. It's not an actual casket. So you literally saw eight figures lined up next to each other in a talis in this unfathomable tragedy and funeral that was um, miles and miles long. And the following week, I went to pay several shiva calls. I brought one of my Israeli friends who can serve as a translator and interpreter for me. And I remember the feeling of just complete and total overwhelming grief and sorrow and crying and anguish and pain. After the funeral, I could not stop crying. I was so, so grief stricken and upset and had this huge void in me. Um, that I really wasn't able to console. And I called my brother, who was also in yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael at the time, and I said to him, how am I not supposed to be sad on Shabbos? I just went to this funeral. This tragedy happened across the street from me. I can't stop crying. How am I supposed to go into Shabbos? And what he said to me, I've held very closely for the last 12 years, and I think applies so much to life right now. He said, you know, when Hashem has a decree and when Hashem does something, anybody who's impacted by, by, by that decree is supposed to be impacted. That's intentional. So when Hashem decreed the Merkah Sarav massacre, part of that decree was Chana Parl Handler is supposed to be impacted the way she is. This is not an accident that you feel the way you feel. Hashem wants you to experience it like this. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Anytime Hashem puts forth anything in this world that any of us are impacted by, it's intentional. Rav Elia Lapian talks about this concept in detail 
and he talks about the idea of life insurance from this perspective. And he says that really the best life insurance is to surround oneself with good friends. Because even if somebody is deserving of a negative decree, if their friends are not deserving of having any anguish or negative impact from that decree, that person's not going to have that decree. Because their friend didn't do anything wrong. So Hashem's not going to decree something that's going to have a negative impact on other people if they're not supposed to have that negative impact and they're not supposed to experience that. I gave a presentation a few years ago, also on Shavuos actually, to a group of high school girls and uh, I was talking about the idea of owning our lives and kind of working through the go-to victim mindset that human nature so easily slides into and working through the why did this happen to me I couldn't do anything about it this is so upsetting working through all of that and I explored with the girls when anything happens to us and when we find ourselves in a position that we're uncomfortable with we really have two options and two different approaches of how to look at it the first one I explained is to take a step back and a sense of ownership and think did I have anything to do with the situation I'm in could I have changed the outcome in any way? If I put forth more thought, more intention, I wasn't as impulsive, I wasn't as reactive, did my decision, or indecisiveness for that matter, directly contribute to the position that I'm in right now? So I explained to the girls that with that mentality, which the answer is usually yes, we feel a lot more empowered, have a lot more control over our lives, and then we can develop what we call a transferable skill. So figure out not just what went wrong now, but how to apply that in the future. Okay, so I didn't have good time management. I ended up late for this interview for future interviews or important appointments. I'll leave five minutes early. Transferable skill. As the famous quote by Nelson Mandela goes, I never lose. I either win or I learn. And that's a concept that we really impart to our children in our program Atidenu for fourth through sixth graders already, we help them recognize the value of always, always trying because there's best case scenarios either way when you try. We talk about Babe Ruth's famous quote, never let the fear of striking out prevent you from playing the game. So we tell the kids, if you try and you succeed, that's great. If you try and you fail and you learn a lesson, that's great. But if you don't try at all, you're not going to succeed and you're not going to know what potential life lessons you could have had. So occasionally we take a step back, we ask ourselves, could I have done anything to prevent this? And the answer is no. COVID, for example, taking over the world. There's nothing that I could have personally done at all to prevent this from happening. Well, in that case, we have option B. And that is taking a step back and realizing that anything that happens to us and any way that we're impacted is completely from Hashem. And that's exactly where Hashem wants us to be. This situation that I'm in right now is custom made exactly for me and is the best situation that I can possibly be in. So. Once this perspective is kind of engaged and embraced, okay, something happened, I don't like it, did I do anything to contribute to it? No, okay, this is exactly what Hashem wants for me. Then my next step is usually, okay, how and what? So how can I maximize the situation? What can I do to grow and develop? On a personal note, I try to stay away from the why did this happen to me. I find that that engages anxiety, endless options, why are you doing this to me, Hashem? I don't ever know why Hashem does anything, but I do know that every situation I'm in is custom designed for me in that moment, the way that I'm interpreting it and experiencing it. And then I can go to the, what can I do about it? And how can I maximize the situation? So you know those moments when you're just going about your day and then you hear something so profound and you think, whoa, play that back. I wanna hear that again. About six months ago, I was in the gym and it was a Sunday morning and it was the second class of the day and we were tired and the trainer was calling out different things for us to do and we're working hard. And suddenly I hear him say something like, 
Check your a and &E level. All you can control in life is your attitude and your effort. What's your a and &E level? And I remember thinking, whoa, that's really smart and that's so true. All you can control in life is your attitude and effort. Naturally speaking, I went home and I called our program director of Atidenu and I had her make a sign that says, what's your A and E level? And you have an A over here with a little lever and then an E over here. And it says, all you can control in life is your attitude and your effort. And I have that sign hanging now at Atidenu and my private practice and my home office. And of course, we printed out an extra five for the owner of the gyms and all the gyms he has because that perspective and that statement and that reality is so powerful and so true. Tonight, I'd like to actually propose a third option of how to respond to situations that seem uncomfortable and that feel negative. And this option kind of combines the first two together. When we're in a situation that we don't want to be in, that feels uncomfortable and that we're interpreting as negative, we take a step back and say, could I have done anything to prevent it? If or when the answer is yes, that is not at the exclusion of this is exactly where Hashem wants me to be. That's in addition to, yes, I have some level of accountability to this unfortunate situation and this is exactly where Hashem wants me to be right now. I kind of look at it as a parent who's helping their child develop and grow and at different stages in life, they give their children new freedoms. And within that freedom, there's always that chance for abusing the freedom. So they have consequences set in place and the child abuses the freedom and they have the consequence and that's how they grow and develop. The parent may not have wanted the child to abuse the freedom, but they anticipated it, expected it to happen and had that consequence in place. What a safe feeling for us to know that even when things are my fault, quote unquote, this is exactly where Hashem wants us to be. We are so tremendously fortunate to have such a timeless guide to life to guide us in any situation at any point in our lives. The Torah literally will give us guidance in every situation of how to maximize the situation and how to grow and develop and become the best person that we can become. The next time that we begin to feel frustrated or annoyed or experience anything negative, let's just take a step back and ask, what's my a and &E level right now? I wish you all a wonderful Shavuos, and I hope to be back next year to present again with Mashiach. Bimher v'yameinu, amen. Wow, Hannah Perel, those were, uh, those were incredibly deep words and uh, some really deep lessons. Uh, I will definitely look at a and &E differently. What's my attitude and, and what's my effort level? That's, uh, it's incredibly relevant in life. Um, and, uh, you know, we often use, um, you know, different analogies to understand things a little bit better. And, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sports subtext to our, our talk. And, uh, people might be wondering why that is. Well, first of all, because Cleveland is a sports aggrieved town. That's, uh, unfortunately still the case. Um, and also because sports is really on, on some level a, uh, a muscle for life you know in life you know you could either you, there's only one way to there's only one way to to, to 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 engage in a sport and that is to play and when you play a sport there's no room to to step out there's no room to to unengage you, you, as a player you've got it you've got you've got to play to the end and in life we've got to engage and play to the end and a and e is incredibly important in sports as it is in life so thank you so much everybody for for coming tonight for 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 sharing for, for all the presenters for sharing your incredible time so generously your incredible expertise your incredible thoughts and your talents hashem gave you hashem should continue to bless you with all that is good with health with wealth with happiness with everything that you need and could want for good hashem should bless you and your families um, may, may be fulfilled very much in a revealed and open way and so on shuas we have the ability to tap into our inner core and to bring it out in a revealed way, in a way that, that, that creates and brings down, connects the physical with the spiritual and brings mitzvahs into this world and elevates this world. Like Hanukkah Parl said, No, I can't do it.